So um, before we properly start, everybody, a lot of you have found the chat function is down the side. Um, use it for having a chat with us, with each other. Uh, keep it friendly. Those are the only rules with that, really. Um, there's also a Q&A function, which is the thing to use if you've got questions for anybody on the panel. The chat moves really fast. The Q&A is much easier for us to keep up with, and Matt is going to be keeping an eye on that. Um, so if you see a watch, have questions, put it in the Q&A. We're going to stop after each watch and answer your questions if we can. Um, I think that's about it for housekeeping, I think. Uh, so let's get started. So welcome to the 17th Time for a Pint Virtual Get, get Together. Can't get my words out today. I'm Chris. Hello. Over there's Matt. You want to Morning. Introduce somebody, maybe, whoever you like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to welcome. I'm pleased to welcome Chris Hall uh, this evening, a watch editor at Mr. Porter. Although some of you may know him from his days at um, Salon PP and QP Magazine. Chris, welcome. Hi. Thanks very much for having me. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, James Downey. That is the extent of his introduction. Um, if you don't know who he is, that was it, wasn't it, James? I did that right. Yep. That's... Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Su well, suitably dismissive. Say. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You can leave now. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, good. Um, this is going to be the level for this evening, isn't it? I could feel it already. <laughs> so I, you did invite me. I'm sorry. Did, you, you, I, it's not like the first time you've met me. You know what you get. <laughs> I did. I knew what I was getting myself in for, and yet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the other booking or one of those notorious chat show moments where it just explodes, and I'm the. I, I'll be the guest who sort of sits there. <laughs> I'm not sure who I'm meant to be then. Am I like the band guy? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Musician? Right. Who knows? Okay. Before we lose too many people, um, let's put some watches on the screen. Um, we are going to start with James and something called the Texan. Over to you, James. Hello. Yeah, there it is. That's the beast. It's... It's one of my favourite watches for, for a whole number of reasons. It's one of the rare pieces that Rolex didn't make the movement for. Rolex didn't make the case for it. And they almost, they certainly didn't make the dial or the hands because they only started making their own dials a few years ago and they still don't make their own hands. So this is a watch that Rolex sold, but which they had almost nothing to do with. Uh, but that's not the reason I love it. The reason I love it is it's not like any other Rolex. If it wasn't for the milled bezel, you'd never think it was a Rolex. It's much chunkier. It's really heavy. And it has, it has a wrist presence. It has, that's what I love about it. It, it. You know you're wearing the damn thing. Because it was made, designed in the, late 60s, produced in 1970, it was made when gold was $35 an ounce. So they didn't really care about how much gold you use. This damn thing weighs a quarter of a pound. You know you've got something on your wrist. And the other things I love about it is that it's using the Beta 21 quartz movement, which was Switzerland's first quartz movement. And like most things in Switzerland, it was not the work of one brilliant individual. Rather, it was another one of those Swiss committees which probably also designed the camel. So this had input from all sorts of sources. And because of that came out, was designed before Seiko made a quartz wrist watch, but didn't come out until after Seiko had brought out a quartz wrist watch. But the things about it is, what, being quartz, it is damned accurate. It, it was sold at that time at five seconds a month, and it still keeps that. Actually, it does better than that. It's about two seconds a month on my wrist. But crucially, this was before the development of stepper motors. And so the quartz second hand this goes round just like a Accutron hand or a Seiko spring drive or the very best automatic 36,000 beat watches. In other words, it's an invisible movement. It just 
glides around the Nile. So it doesn't have that stigma that people, I say, inaccurately apply to quartz watches that, oh, look, the second hand steps, so it must be a piece of shit. It doesn't. So nobody would know what it is. Nobody thinks it's a Rolex. Nobody thinks it's a quartz. Um, so it, it's an invisible, unique Rolex. And I use the word unique almost correctly because it's one of only two models that Rolex ever made that were actually a numbered limited edition. Each watch is engraved on the side. And in classic Rolex, instead of, you know, everybody else just stamps a number. No, on this one, the number is actually hand engraved on the side of the case. Um, in my case, it's number 800. They made 1,000 of these. And it's discreetly engraved on the back of on the back of the case side. So you would never see it unless you really look for it. Um, it's just it's just a nice piece to have on your wrist. Thank you. I, I have questions. I have questions. Go. So uh, there's a thousand of these. Is that white gold and yellow gold total one thousand yes. pieces? Yes. It, it's believed that about between 75 and 80 percent were yellow gold and the rest the rest of white gold and does the gold carry on to the dial furniture in the hands yes james okay. have you ever Please. come across a better example than your own uh yes I've, i have seen pictures of better ones than mine but I've never actually handled it. I, I saw a uh, pictures of one with a uh, Omani insignia on the dial a and on the case back. Yeah, the nice. Kanjar. Nice. Yeah, that would have been a nice thing to have. I've also seen pictures of one with a black dial, but again, I've never handled one. Uh, I think this would look sensational with a black dial. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm very happy with what I have. Very cool. <clears throat> How long does the battery last out of interest? About eight months. I was thinking I think about that. D does the lack of stepper motors make it a bit power hungry? Yes, it is. And what's really interesting is when these were new, the paperwork that you got uh, with it which I should have uploaded, actually, it's really interesting because the, the instruction booklet, the guarantee booklet says that you're a member of the exclusive Rolex Gold Club. And it entitles you to two things. One is that the next time you're in Geneva, you can come to the factory and you can sign the exclusive Rolex Gold, Reg Gold Club register and, and, and be invited to a tour of the factory. Wow. Uh, but also, crucially, it says that on presentation of this document, you will get free battery replacement for life. Fantastic. Yeah. They still so have you taken them up on their offer of the free tour? No, because I've been to the factory four times already, and so uh, I, I thought it would be a bit pushy doing it. And it might preclude them asking me again on a more on a proper one. realistic <laughs> occasion. So I think that's... I'll... We've had a couple of questions from the audience so far. Um, yeah. Torsten, Torsten asked about the crystal. Yes, What's it made from? Sapphire. Sapphire. Thank you. It was and the first gents Rolex to use a sapphire crystal. So another first. Yep. And where did it sit within the range? I mean, at that time, it was pretty expensive, I guess. It was obscenely expensive. At uh, this time, the most expensive regularly catalogued piece was the 1803 day date with a president bracelet uh, and that sold for ex just under one third of what this listed at cramps i think i think the figures are it was 5000 swiss francs and 16,000 for the Beta 21. My goodness. Th there's a question about the case. Um, yes, sir. Chris, we haven't got a picture of the case, have we? 
That's it from the side. So it's a question to whether it's an oyster case. It's not an oyster case. It's a very, very interesting case, but it's certainly not an oyster. No, it, it is not an oyster case. It is it is listed in the in Rolex's description of it as being waterproof, but it's not an oyster. It doesn't have a screw down crown. It doesn't have a screw back. It has the most complex case construction of any Rolex watch I've ever seen. Um, the other first on this watch is that it was the first ever Rolex with an integrated bracelet. In other words, this watch could not have a leather strap. Um, and the, the strap, the bracelet attachment is a part of the case construction, and it's how you remove the case back. You had to remove the bracelet and then remove the bracelet attachment parts, and that enables you to take the back off. Um, it's heavily gasketed, so I think it's probably as waterproof as a lot of watches from that period. But I, I mean, I washed my hands of it without worrying about it, but any, anywhere past that, forget it. And finally, what sort of size is it? It is reaching for my vernier calipers, taking the watch off my wrist as we speak. It is a cross. It is 38.6 across and from lug to lug, it is 45.2 and it is 13 millimeters high off the wrist. So it's a man sized watch. It's quite a big thing. Yeah. And um, finally, do you, do you still get free battery replacement from Rolex? I have not taken them up on their offer. Um, I will try. Uh, I suppose I should try at some point. Yeah, definitely before you next come back on as a guest. You should definitely try. <laughs> um, for anybody that wants more pictures of this particular watch and to hear James talk about it more, and I, this had totally forgot my mind, slipped my mind. The last time James and I sat down to actually do something digitally, it was episode 33 of the podcast. Um, so there is an angled picture and there's also one of the side which shows the really nice detail on the crown as well. It has got This watch has got a beautiful crown. Just lovely. Um, Wonderful. So episode 33, if you want to go listen to James talk more about Beta 21, it's an entire episode about Beta 21s. Okay. On to you had to stop me. <laughs> On to James's <laughs> next watch. Wait, James has brought two watches. James has brought two watches. Someone gets to cheat every week, and this week it's James. So, you know. I wondered what I could bring that would be almost the polar opposite of the Beta 21. And so I picked this late 1920s rectangular Breguet wristwatch. I love it for a number of reasons. Um, it's a classic Breguet. It's made by the family who made more Breguets than anybody else. And that's not the Breguet family, that's the Brown family. Because for most of its existence, Breguet was an English company, or at least run by an English family. And they were responsible for, for the stewardship of the company for well over a hundred years. Um, and what I love about it is, again, what I love about the, the Rolex. It's not your average Breguet. We've, I, I, I was going to say, I hate to be rude about anybody, but you know that's not true. Uh, I'm rude about everybody. So what I dislike about Breguet, the current Breguet company, is that they're, they're like Panerai. They just keep, they keep repeating the same stuff. They've become, the, they've become a cliche of themselves. And what was great about Breguet is that when A.L. Breguet was alive, he was the 18th century equivalent of Groibel Fawcett. He was the cutting edge. He was doing weird shit. He wasn't doing boring, repetitive stuff. And what Breguet does now 
is beautifully crafted and some of their work on um, silicon escapements and things is really cutting edge but most of their stuff is repeating the same cliches and doing variations on a theme it's as if mozart never did the operas never did anything else just did variations on one stinking concerto it, it, it that they could do much better and what i'd like to see them do is plumb some of the some of their heritage that isn't guilloche dials and coin edges on a round case and this is a perfect example this was made in 1929 for a gentleman whose name i can look up but i'm too lazy to do that um 1929 was the world was in the pits economically and it took breguet believe it or not nine years to sell this watch so it was made in 29 but not sold until 37 so it's eight years i apologize and when it was sold I think the problem that it had sat unused for so long caused a bit of a problem with the movement. The, the oils in those days were really crappy. They were all natural oils um, extracted either from petroleum extracts or from whales. And they had a tendency to gum up and go nasty. And I think that's what happened with this watch because with these with these watches what Breguet did was if we can switch the slides now the the number on the dial and the number on the case back 2167 are the same as the movement number they they everything was unified however with this poor thing the movement gave out after 18 months and the nice gentleman had to send it back to Breguet and rather than uh repair it they slotted in an identical movement but which as you'll see now has a slightly different number two three one nine so in the nine in the eight years no nine years between this being made and the second movement being fitted they'd made 200 watches because we can see the uh, the difference in the serial numbers and what we can see in that movement is is the this is, the movement that we're looking at is is Breguet, but in fact it, it is a lecoultre eboche as used by Patek, Vacheron, Cartier, pretty much everybody else at that time. But it is stunningly finished, yeah. wonderful hand engraved, what hand hand produced Geneva stripes, great anglage, lovely engraving, fabulous dial click. I mean, it's just it's just a beautiful piece of work. And this is what handmade watches were like at a period, this period between the 20s and the late 50s, in my opinion, is the pinnacle of handmade watches. The perfect Hamiltons coming out of the US, these watches coming out of France, the Pateks, Vacherons, Cartier is coming out of Switzerland were as good as handmade watches ever got. Nowadays, apart from the one piece made by Global Forcey, everything else is made with the benefit of machines which can achieve much finer tolerances than humans ever did, but can't achieve the elegance and the classicism that we see then. And so, yep, I love my big butch quartz watch. But I love this too. Superb stuff. Can you um, slip onto the front on picture again, please, Chris? <clears throat> so many people can, um, talking about this uh, dial, the font and the numerals on it. It's um, really unusual for a breguet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah uh, uh, that's again what I, you know, that's what I said at the beginning. It's, it, it's, not, like your, it's not what people think breguet is. But at that time, Breguet were doing all sorts of stuff. They were, they were doing anything they could to get the money in the door. 
Mm. Um, and, and they did, essentially, this was the platform shoes of the day. This was the height of fashion. This was classic Art Deco. Look at, the, uh, look at those angular fonts. Mm. It, 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 it is absolutely of the moment of the late 20s. Hmm. You can't really tell from, from that paper, at least I can't, but are they, are they printed or applied? They are, uh, oh, neither of those. They are, as, as with all great watches of that period, we have a solid silver dial, which is electroplated. The numbers are stamped, and the minute track also, and the Breguet signature are stamped, uh, are engraved into the dial surface filled with black enamel and then fired to produce a permanent number on the dial. Beautiful. Um, everybody did it back then. Nobody does it now. It's expensive. It's high risk of failure, but it produces a permanent fixture. This and uh, porcelain dials, where the numbers are actually baked into the enamel, are the two classic ways of producing a permanent dial design. And uh, my, uh, my little uh, Louis Cotier World Time has the same method of, of dial construction, uh, as did most of the patics from that. Lovely. Um, any any questions before we let James um, grab loose? Loose Luce or loose? I was about to say, I thought you might want a drink or something. Don't let him loose. I am. Um, I really like this, James. I I know what you're saying about Breguet. Like everyone there is very lovely, um, but the watches aren't exactly trying hard, to put it mildly. <laughs> But when they do, but when they do do something unusual, like the strange kind of dive of dive watches and things like that, people don't really like those. So they're kind of between a rock and a hard place, something when it comes to design. I, I kind of yeah, but I think they, they created that for themselves. Yeah, I mean, they they seem to have pushed themselves into this corner where they essentially make export watches for vast sums of money for people that are not really interested in a watch, but are interested in owning a very expensive thing that happens to be a watch. Hmm. Like a lot of their catalog feels like that. Like there's, there's gemstones, there's precious metals, there's complications that, that are in really weird cases. Um, like I don't have small wrists and quite a lot of their watches I put on and they look daft because they're so big. It's just a big chunk of precious metal. Um, for the sake mm. of being a big chunk of precious metal. Um, it doesn't, I, I'm with you on that. I don't think Breguet now have the, you know, the kind of the class perhaps of Breguet that existed in the past. It's just, it's the top end brand that sits at the top of the Swatch Group. Um, which is, I, I don't know. I mean, is, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. They're, they're slowly eliminating the sports watches from their catalogue. Like the Type 20 is gone. The Type 21 is about to go. Yeah, exactly. The Type 20 is gone just as everyone else is getting back into Type 20. Yeah. I do. I, I, mean, wouldn't, I wouldn't count that out, personally speaking. I think the one they did for the model they produced for Only Watch last year yeah. um, shows that I don't think they've given up on that family. You mean yeah. the one with the camel shit coloured dial? <laughs> I've never it seen that um, kind of excrement, James. Yeah. But uh, if you mean glorious sure. shade of brown, then perhaps yes. yes. <laughs> it's two different marketing departments there, aren't there? There's the camel shit, and then there's glorious shade of brown. Um, I feel that's a good time to move on. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, James. Uh, Mr. Hall, over to you, sir. All right. And okay. Um, well, yes. Yeah, so, Vertex review. Automatic. Automatic is probably, um, well, it does say it on the dial. This is a watch about which I don't know an extremely large amount, which might be perhaps a surprise then to hear that I've chosen to talk about it. Um, but it is a very personal watch. So that's that's the reason. Um, this was my grandfather's watch. Uh, he passed away some years ago, getting on for a decade ago. Um, and I only became aware of this watch's existence uh, how many years ago now? I think 
four years ago when my grandmother uh, had suddenly um, produced it from, from a box somewhere in the attic. And it was a watch that he had been given. Uh, and as we'll see when we move on, we don't need to move on just yet, but we will see. It, he was given this watch in the sort of traditional fashion as a, um, a gift for long service at the company where he worked. And uh, it's, it's like 18 karat gold. Uh, this is gold um, dial and obviously solid gold case. Don't know what the dial is, sort of, yeah, might be a solid gold dial, but you know what I mean? It is a fully gold colored watch. And that was very much not my granddad in any respect. Um, whether he had been a, a Navy man and he was uh, worked at a metal works and worked his way up there, but he was quite um, a humble man, I suppose. Uh, and you, you wouldn't really have caught him dead with anything quite so flashy as this. And uh, so I think it just, it just laid un untouched and almost certainly unworn. Um, for years and when I came into it's when it came into my possession it still had the original black strap and that was it had no signs of where no markings where it might have been buckled up um it had degraded slightly so I've put it on a new uh, Jean Rousseau strap to wear it but it was clearly completely unworn um and I wore it to to get married in it's a watch I preserve for special occasions um I had it briefly looked at to get it running again I think it had um the winding stem had uh, perhaps just completely seized through through in use. Um, and it, it's now, you know, I've never measured how good time it keeps, but uh, it, it, it does the job. Uh, it's not a watch you wear more than sort of one day or two and then you put it straight back away and it's going to be kept for another few months before you wear it again. And um, it's my special occasions watch. If we go through the, the, the pictures, we'll see that, you know, there's some... Um, there's nothing to it on the on the case back. Oh, yeah, first of all, yes, here we go. In its in its original box, as it was presented, the case back uses yeah has very very little to it. No engraving. Um, they didn't they didn't go to the, the trouble of engraving the watch. They wrote a sort of a nice message to go with it. But um, it is to all intents and purposes quite anonymous otherwise. And Vertex obviously at the time, huge huge volume company. Um, Vertex Review at that time making watches as Vertexes and just and Vertex Review possibly whether they were still making watches as review on its own. I'm not sure because it's not a company with a, a sort of unbroken lineage that we have today. Don Cochran, who many of you will know from modern day Vertex, was kind enough to provide me with a little bit of information about it, but this isn't the brand that's um, maintained its sort of uh, its marketing stories. So it was pretty hard for me to find out more than a catalog page for the watch. Um, and so, yes, it, it would have been one of many, many, many thousands. I, I don't doubt. I think the people who would have bought it would have gone to their local high street jewellers and sort of gone, oh, what's, a, what's a quite decent looking gold watch, you know, in budget? Well, OK, how about that one? And um, so nevertheless, it, it's special to me rather than sort of special horologically speaking. Um, as you can see here and underneath the case, we have that little handwritten note and I have that um Look on the next slide, sorry, I muted myself there, that's, uh, that's silly. We can see here, in recognition of 25 years service with Chippenham Castings Co, which was a metal, uh, sort of steel, steelworks, metalworks sort of um, company where he worked. And um, the whole thing in pretty good nick. Uh, 25 years service, then this would have been, how was he born, 1920 something? This is, this is you know, early 70s. And yes, to, to the questions, yes, it's solid 18 carats. Um, I don't have any uh, close-up pictures of, of hallmarkings, I'm afraid. I actually don't think it is a hallmarking. It's an arrow. Uh, well, under one lug, there's a... I should have brought my own loop to this conversation, shouldn't I? There's a little arrow oh, pointed to the... Uh, yeah, <coughs> thanks. Just... Um, I think it actually, yes, no, it is. There is a hallmark there. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say in the preparation of this chat, I haven't checked it out. Um, but they only made this in uh, nine carat or 18 carat. And um, Don, I think from the from other tiny, tiny details, we think this is the 18 carat version. And uh, yes. yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, <laughs> ask away if there's anything else you want to know. It's um, size-wise, I've not got my 
set of calipers to hand. I, I think it, it's, um, I'd say it wears about 37 millimetres, probably. It's a big-ish by the standards of the day. Um, or average, perhaps. Yeah, I'd say it's about 37. Is there, a slight, is there a slight vertical brushing to the dial? Yeah, there is. It's got this very fine sort of, I think what would be these days marketed as a sort of a satin finish or a brush, yeah, finish. Um, with that little vertex nameplate sort of standing proud of it. Yeah, it's cute, isn't it? Yeah. Again, the fineness of the minute marks really, really nice yeah. as well. You know, it's big, nice contrast to the, the chunkiness of those applied markers. Absolutely. It's quite a sort of a fine, fancy thing, which is obviously another reason it clearly never got worn because my granddad took one look at it and thought, nah, nah not that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know what the movement is in there, Chris? I'm afraid not. Um, there's, I've not been able to unearth any literature on it and I haven't plucked up the courage to just um, take the case back off um, because, as I say, I sort of treat it with a certain degree of reverence. Um, I've got the, the sort of bits and pieces to do so if I did, but, um, yeah, maybe I should just uh, pluck up the courage and, and, and do it and find out. It's probably... Right now. Yeah, right now. No time like the <laughs> present. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to see see a man ping a, um, a why don't you have a couple of drinks? Live and, into a couple a of drinks while I'm talking, and then come back and we'll have a live opening, like an unboxing. Yeah. It's very very YouTube. An uncasing. Let's see. I I'm perhaps going to politely decline, but um, <laughs> it seems fair. I have a chisel. You have <laughs> actually more or less within it's reach. So do I, but um, that isn't going to help us. No chisels, no chisels. I feel like Kathleen with the no eating radium. No using chisels yeah. on watch cases, please. Thank you. I'm not even gonna... is an interesting company. I, know, I mean, I know Dom's done a, a grand job kind of picking out part of that kind of vertex history in particular, you know, around the kind of the Dirty Dozen style watch and kind of modernizing it. But yeah. when I look back through old kind of BHI journals and, and stuff, the vertex adverts, so they're all, you know, they're all the way through. Um, they obviously had a, a very long and interesting time selling, a, as you said, a shed load of watches. Yeah, I mean, I um, again, I mean, I'm afraid to say I haven't, um, I haven't gone away and done a huge amount of homework in advance of this on the fate of Vertex. James probably knows more than I do, but I, um, you know, quartz crisis uh, is probably the two-word summary. Um, but yeah, they they were like so many other brands you you know of these days that were absolute powerhouses in their day. Uh, and um, yeah, just sort of vanished without uh, without trace in a way. Yeah. My understanding is that Vertex were a marketing brand of Review Tommen, and uh, Review Tommen was the main factory who, mm -hmm. and they actually did produce their own movements for quite a long while. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Vertex was kind of their their top end stuff. Their less expensive stuff was sold under the review and review Tommen label. That rings the bell, actually. Vertex, having been acquired by them at some point between 1945 and 1960 ish. Yeah. 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 I certainly. I think the Vertex was only sold in the UK because of, of its history right. with uh, having one of the www suppliers right I, I yeah, actually, I, i'm looking through my notes from last week where i had a marvin which is also, was also a, a sort of dragged into the same company in the end uh, yeah in 76 they'd become msr group that's right included yes. marvin vertex uh review thom and, and about four others uh, so back in and back in the 50s so i'm just looking at um peloton's watch escapements the third edition from 1950 the vertex advert there says sole distributors of movado and Ernetto in great britain and northern ireland so oh. they goodness knows what else they did yeah. hmm. interesting um any oh. any more questions from anybody uh people with people opening a pool to bet on the caliber so hopefully you can take that to instagram or comments or something um, yeah, mostly uh, people now just want to see me open it. <laughs> I haven't, as as is people, I haven't even got a cheese knife. <laughs> I haven't even got a cheese knife. 
<laughs> I can't uh, say I'm not disappointed. Not that would do as well, much good a, with this. Would well, you have a caviar spoon? spoon? Would I have a exactly. caviar spoon? Caviar spoon. Oh. Mother of pearl works particularly well on cold. Yes. Not up, not up here in the attic. <laughs> You mean you don't have a caviar fridge in the attic? What? Come on. <laughs> my my work from home setup doesn't yet extend to at desk caviar, but I, like, it would be... I like the yet, Mr. Porter. Exactly. I've got <laughs> ambitions. Mr. Porter, I, dude. I, I shouldn't say it too loud. My wife will catch wind of these plans. Um, who's who's the parent company of Mr. Porter again? You, you right now, Porter? everybody. Exactly. <laughs> Quite, quite a lot of money behind it. Surely it's only a matter of time before the senior watch editor, Mr. Porter, gets his own caviar jar. Mr. Mr. Porter's actually owned by Dave's Caviar Emporium. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all a big ploy for more caviar. More Let's caviar. see if it's playing the long yeah. game. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously... Dial, caviar dial. It's, it's, I only joined Mr. Porter this year. Perhaps, um, perhaps I'm yet to discover that every employee gets a jar of caviar for Christmas. Who, who knows? But, um, wow. I know they sent me similar amounts of gear. So, I anyway, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, You're welcome, Matt. Over to you, sir. Over to me, Charles Frodgen 07180. Um, the catchly named 07180. Um, like the Breguet, this uh, you got this both our albums. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. this is their tricky second album. <laughs> uh, like the Breguet. Um, this uh, the movement number matches this. Um, so this is a, an open face keyless um, pocket watch from 1887, although the components actually took a couple of years to pull together. So Richard Stenning, who I didn't see in the participants, but is usually around. Um, and I know Philip White's around. Um, <clears throat> this was a, a gold uh, keyless open face pocket watch, the lever escapement, compensation balance, which we'll look at in a minute. Uh, jeweled in five holes. So that shows you how old it is. <laughs> um, obviously an enamel dial on it, which you can All five. You know, quite, clearly, <laughs> quite clearly see there. Um, and no domed case or anything. It's just a, a very plain kind of looking thing. Um, it's called a size four watch. And I asked Richard about this to see whether they had any more information because it's actually, um, let, me, let me show you. It's actually quite small. Uh, so, what do people hold up when they, I don't know, it's like a phone or something? As you can see, it's pretty small. Um, I guess if it were a wristwatch, uh, wrist people saying, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it's kind of wristwatch size or a boy's model as um, many people try to, to sell them as on, online. Um, although you doubt that boys would have had a, a watch like this. Um, you know, classic kind of Charles Fortune, and classic English kind of look to it uh, with those numerals and um, hands. I love the waist on the, on the long minute hand. And again, the, the, the kind of elongated spade on the hour, but um, just just beautiful. So I asked Richard for a bit more information. He told me that the uh, the movement was 10 shillings and sixpence. And that was uh, delivered in, on the 30th of August, 1885. The dial itself uh, was made by Herbert for two and six on the 22nd of July, 85, it was delivered, two and six. For a dial like this, I mean, we, we should have Anne or Dane on here and ask them if they can do us a couple for two and six. Even with inflation, that seems cheap, but um, actually, I should work out what that is with inflation. Uh, the case was made by Newman and it's gold, so that was three quid, 12 shillings, and a penny. Is that right? Three slash 12 slash one. Yep. Um, uh, delivered on the 9th of September 1886 with a London hallmark. Uh, total manufacturing costs. 11 pounds, 17 shillings and threepence. And it entered into stock in 1887. So I, I ran that through the Bank of England inflation calculator and that came out at 1,590 um, pounds. So if they then applied the usual kind of markup, you can imagine this could be, you know, three and a half, four and a half grand, you know, four, four and a half thousand pound watch now, um, which isn't what it cost me at all. I bought it off um, Tobias Birch for a lot less than that. Um, if we flick on to the next, uh, the next picture, um, so it's, uh, you can see that engraving over the raised barrel, um, which I think is rather nice. Um, uh, the by appointment, because they still had the appointment then, um, uh, the Royal, actually they still have it. So <laughs> when I say still, it, it continues um, uh, by appointment. And um, 
as you can see on the left hand side that 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 um, that balance uh, which again works really well i've had it serviced it it runs it runs pretty well i don't carry it around very often um it's the kind of thing if i had bought 20 odd years ago i would have like chris uh, worn it at my wedding i'm sure um and, and i rather like it if we uh move on to the next slide um just a quick question from Seth, who asked the case maker. It was Newman. Um, so Newman and Co, I guess, the, the company, rather than one of the many Newmans, um, I think. And Jimmy said, do I have a watch chain on FOB? Uh, I don't. Um, I don't have a watch chain uh, yet. Um, it's one of the things I want to look out for. At the moment, I kind of wear it on a leather. I wear it on leather. I kind of quite like the idea of leather on gold rather than gold on gold. I'm not a big fan of kind of metal or metal action. It kind of seems like a bit of a shame, really, when you've got an old piece to batter up it even further, but who knows. Um, so as I said, uh, I, apologies for the quality of this, but I tried to rake the light across it so you could see a bit more of that engraving, um, which I really like. You can just see as it kind of just falls off the edge of the, of the movement as well. Um, it's, a, it's a very pretty thing in my eye. And as you can see, 07180, uh, engraved on the back with the Frodsham symbol. Um, the timekeeping. So Wolfie's asked what the timekeeping's like. I think it's not bad for a watch that was retailed the year before Jack the Ripper started killing people. I mean, it it it's it's not bad. I mean, I don't you know, I'm not going to miss a train, um, which is good. But you know, if I had to time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't know. What do I have to time to the second nowadays? I can't think of anything. If I had to time a Formula One race, it would be pretty lousy. Um, and there we are. There. So by appointment to the Queen, as you can see, it's upside down there. 84, the Strand, London. So um, next time you're walking down the Strand, look for number 84. It's where Charles Frodsham used to be before they moved again and again and again and again and finally ended up in Perry Street. Um, what, what, tell me about the balance. Well, when it says compensation balance, as you can see, it's split there and you can see it's got two, you can just see the two metals. So it's, it's okay. compensated. Um, um, but it's a classic bimetallic uh, compensation balance, I'd say. Philip White is, I think, around. He'll probably say that I'm a complete idiot and shouldn't have said that. It's something completely different. Who knows? I think it's quite a pretty thing. I think it's a really it's pretty thing. great. Uh, blued hairspring or I yeah really yeah it is it. blue you can just see it you can just see it um yeah in that light i don't know if the previous picture i think the previous picture had too much light and it came out black but yeah there's blued springs the, 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 the blue band spring the, the screws are blued everywhere um as you can see um <clears throat> yeah it did i really like it it's perfect for that the one thing about this size is it's perfect for that weird jeans pocket <laughs> the one that, that nothing else fits in. Even a Zippo lighter kind of sticks out the top. This fits perfectly. So, so there we what are. kind of um, conditions the enamel dial in? It looked really good when that first. Pick. Flip back, Chris. Um, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, is that? It's I mean, to, to look closer, is there no no trace of, of cracking or spidering or anything on there? No, no cracking, no spidering. People knew how to do it, especially for two and six. <laughs> um, and as James pointed out previously, you know this is this is permanent. This isn't painted on. This is these are permanently marked dials. That yeah. is it it's, a countersunk dial? Is it a two piece dial? No, no, no. There's no countersink. It's 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 a flat dial. I think so. A minute. I have to. Oh, now you've got me wondering. I can't remember. Do you need I'll to, to send you a chisel to open it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so got a very small <laughs> chisel. Wait a minute, I've got I've got a screwdriver. <laughs> Anybody have a loop? <laughs> I have got a loop. You're right. I tell you what, I'll come back to you. Let's not All waste right. any time. Okay. Uh, it's a flat. It is dial a flat dial. Philip says, says it's yeah. a flat. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll leave. I'm I'm pretty sure I would have noticed if it had had, had any more interesting features, James. But but as you know, I get quite flustered. This is only the seventeenth of these. <laughs> Uh, Seth said the fraudulent records probably show who supplied the rough movement, but there's likely marks in the plate. 
So interesting thing, Richard found an entire batch of these movements in the records where there's no information at all. And this sits firmly in the middle of that patch. So nice idea, Seth, but um, unless between Richard and Philip, they can dig out some more, more paper from somewhere. I don't think we know, but, uh, or oh, as you said, take it apart and look for the plate under the dial, which is the other thing we can do with a chisel. <laughs> Oh, you can spot so there who, we are. Are, who are the non-watchmakers in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, right, Chris, yes. what, right. what have you brought today, Christopher? What have I brought? I have brought um, another electronic watch. So this is nowhere near as um, valuable or as exclusive as uh, James's Beta 21. This is a, probably a generation-ish after that. Um, these are... This is a, um, an Omega Constellation Chronometer F300, which has got their Caliber 1250, which was an ESA 9162. Um, it's based off of the, well, it's an, an iteration of the Belova, Belova 217. I'm going to use my hands to, to just remember where things fit. Um, design, the movement was designed by a guy called Max Hetzel, who was a physicist, uh, who is the same person that designed the, uh, the 214 for Belova. Um, the movement that's in this appeared in a lot of watches. It was uh, made by the ESA group. Um, they typically are nickel plated, uh, Omega plated theirs in um, copper. Um, and I've got a moving picture I'll show you in a moment. Um, but this is a sort of a sea cased um, constellation, but not a sea cased constellation. So um, fans of Omega dress watches or everyday watches from the 60s and 70s will know the the sea case constellation um, which is a little bit smaller than this it's 36 millimeters this is nearly 38 plus the crown and a lot a lot longer at 42 um, it's got 20 millimeter lugs it has got a really lovely two-tone blue dial in it um, these came in um, three metal finishes so there was stainless steel which this is there was gold plated uh, and then there was solid gold and i think there are nine dial types um, which go from silver printed, three different colours, including this blue, and then a variety of solid gold dials with solid gold dial furniture. Um, they made a lot of these. Uh, this was quite expensive. So in 1973, this cost £98.50. Uh, in that same year, a Speedmaster was £92.50. Um, this was quite accurate, not as accurate as the Beta 21. Uh, this kept uh, two seconds a day or 60 seconds a month. Uh, these also eight batteries. So the paperwork for this says that you should return to your um, authorized Omega dealer for a new battery at least once every 12 months. And you should not attempt to open the watch yourself. <laughs> it doesn't mention chisels. Chisels. <laughs> <laughs> but it does say you shouldn't open it. Time for a chisel. Time for a chisel. So I... I I've owned quite a few F300 watches. When I first started collecting watches um, and was buying things off eBay and didn't know what I was doing, uh, these were really, really cheap. You could pick things these up for sort of 50 to 100 pounds. There seemed to be an endless uh, variety of them and they were quite often broken and then you had to find someone that could fix them and there aren't that many people that are willing to take them on. Um, I got rid of all of the ones I'd bought, the things I'd bought early on. I had a cone-shaped Seamaster. I had a small 34 millimeter constellation that had been filled with water. Um, this one I bought earlier this year um, to replace a, uh, a sea-cased constellation, which is a, the um, automatic uh, chronometer uh, watch, because uh, it, it was the third one, third one of those I'd had, and they never sit right on my wrist. I sell them, I fall in love with them, I find another one. It still doesn't fit. I sell it, I find another one. It still doesn't fit. And the, th the third time it finally sunk in that it wasn't the watch for me, but I liked the case shape and these were a little bit bigger and fit me better. So uh, this came to me this year um, from a guy in Germany. I was really taken by the, the details on this. So there's um, a couple of things going on with the dials. There's two-tone blue. There is white printing of the minute markers. There are applied hour markers, which have then got... Um, uh, tritium plots at the end of them um, it's steel hands with white overlays are then filled with tritium and a red sweep second hand and then the omega symbol at uh, 12 is red infilled one which at the time meant it was an electronic watch um, so there, there's quite a lot going on um, and I was playing around with the camera today and I quite liked that there's different fonts as well 
So there's, I think, three or four different font types being used on the dial, um, including the Swiss made one at the bottom. There's lots of nice finishes as well. So you have brushing on the main piece of the case. You have a very thick bevel around the edge of the case. You have um, the, re the retaining ring that holds the crystal in place has got a step to it, a polish section, a different type of polish section. Um, it has got one of the earlier types of crown, uh, which they don't issue anymore. So if, you, if I get this serviced and have a new crown fitted, it ends up with a more modern one. This has got a nice sort of knurled crown because you don't really need to set it very much. It's accurate for two seconds a day. You don't need to touch this watch. Um, and a bit of a dome. So, is, so is James's Rolex, but that has a decent size crown. No, it doesn't. It has a, it has a tiny crown. Oh, sorry, James. It's just a very a pretty crown. crown as well. Uh, and this goes back to the days of the early automatics. You look at watches like Harwoods and stuff, they have no crown. Um, or they had all the crowns who were under a cover because they wanted you to show that you didn't need to wind your watch all the time. Mm. So these watches often have tiny crowns and it's kind of a signature. Yeah. Well, there we are. Um, I'm wrong again. <laughs> so it's got, it's got quite a small crown and, it, and it's recessed in this um it's it's got i think i think there's a three-piece gasket system on these so these were water resistant to 50 meters when they were new um i don't know when the seals were last changed in this i don't get it anywhere near water um it's got the constellation on on the case back which is a feature i really like of these watches i love that they've carried it on into the modern ones and the globe master now in particular which has the constellation floating in a piece of sapphire crystal i think that's a cool touch um screw down case back uh it has someone helpfully has engraved a service or etched a service number into one of the lugs which i didn't notice until i was taking pictures today um and that's the movement. So this is the Omega 1250, unadjusted, 12 joules. Uh, it has on the top of it that it is um, licensed from Belova and the patent is owned by the ESA. ESA. So I think it's the, the idea of a tuning fork movement, uh, which is licensed from Belova. Um, and the tuning fork in there replaces the balance within a mechanical watch. So the power goes to the tuning fork. Uh, it vibrates at 300 hertz. That forms the function of a, of a balance uh, of the balance wheel. Um, I really, really like this watch. Um, I am drawn into more owning more of these, but I feel I need to stop because uh, <laughs> the the risk is they are still not particularly expensive, and you could buy lots of them, mm. and then I could be back to where I started with drawers and drawers of non running electronic watches of which there are a limited amount of parts left for and an even more limited amount of watchmakers that are prepared to touch them um but i like yeah. it i'm 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 very into uh um the sort of the 1960s 1970s electronic stuff that came out of switzerland i think it's cool um this has got the original buckle on it you don't tend to see them on these because this buckle also is the one that would have gone with a speedmaster and speedmaster collectors are mental and will pay lots of money for these buckles so that's nice. They, they get mm. taken off and sold, but it, it's going to stay with this watch because I think it's a nice feature. Um, Chris, you should... Um, I was watching a video with uh, well-known car journalist and top gear host Chris Harris, and he mentioned that for every old car he's got that's not incredibly expensive, he has another one, which is just the donor one for parts for when the good one goes wrong. So if he's got a Peugeot 205 GTI, he's got another one because if it's hard to find parts, easier to go and buy a whole other car to you to rip for parts when the good one breaks down. You should do that same with these watches. You should have one that's just, you know, your your backup. See, I can relate to that because I used to have an Audi UR Quattro and then have a spare one for parts. And this was before people were interested in those cars and you could buy a broken one for about yeah. 500 quid and a good one for about two grand. I had the same thing with my MG Metric. Yeah, just have two cars. There you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what has happened, and I've noticed it a lot this year, is there's, there's a lot, there's a much fewer watches moving through secondhand markets this year. I think people are people are holding on to stuff, house clearances aren't happening, um, stuff's not appearing on eBay. Um, so there's not the volume. Like a couple of years ago, or even last year, I could have done an eBay search, Omega F300 pulled up a thousand watches for sale around the world, did it today and there's a hundred. Um, and they're all with dealers and they're asking top money. So, um, I'm going to wait, wait, and wait for the world to go vaguely more normal and people will start throwing out their broken battery-powered watches they don't want and I can scoop them up again. 
Um, so that's it. And th uh, this is it in daylight, and it shows the, the nature of that two tone dial a bit, which is a bit of a pain to photograph um, and shows that it really does need a new crystal. That's great. It's really good. Yeah. Any questions from anybody? Uh, um, just you would one, have seen one little, the one little uh, addition ESA yeah. were the electronic subsidiary of ETA. Ah, that's good to know. So it's essentially Swatch Group yeah. now. Yeah, because these are th these movements, um, the ESA 9162 appear in <clears throat> Longines, Tissot, and a few other things. But in, in that nickel finish, um, and something I was warned of very early on by the watchmaker that used to look after these for me was to make sure you get a movement picture before you buy one to see whether it's got the right movement for the right from the right company in the case. Because when these were when people really didn't want these, you just go and grab a TSO movement and smack it in an Omega or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so, I have an ESA Speed Sonic. Chrono uh, the chronometer chronograph, but one of the Lobster? prototype. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. A prototype, not a, not a, not an Omega, but actually made by ESA mm. uh, as as one to show round to all the brands to show them what the thing looked like. Yeah, I, I have the 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 cushion case Speed Sonic, which is not working yeah. at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think there. I've, I think generally these sort of higher end electronic watches from the 70s are really interesting yeah. um and they were I expensive see. and they're well made and um i think there's a there's a sort of bit of a snobbery around anything that's got a battery in which in some cases i guess is right you know but there's 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 a big difference between the sort of 10 pounds yeah. out of the argus catalog and something a bit more high end yeah, I mean, just quickly flicking through the comments because people still aren't using the q and A. I, I, I think we should just get rid of the current list of attendees, participants, whatever we're calling them nowadays. Rubbish. Uh, Wolf, Wolfie's been providing a running commentary about Max Hetzel. Um, so oh. in the bull of a Sioux DSC, allegedly, um, after they hired Max Hetzel to replicate the Agatron, and he thinks allegedly there was a settlement, allegedly. Uh, yeah. Max Hetzel also created the 720 hertz uh, variant, which is absolutely crazy if you look at how it works. You don't even have to look up how it works, Wolfie. It is absolutely bonkers. I mean, 720 hertz is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's speedy, isn't it? That's, that's the Speedmaster. Speedmaster should be 720. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... <sighs> Proper speed. Yeah, I suppose the Speed Sonic is sort of an electronic Speedmaster, although it's a Seamaster. The first electronic speed master would be the X thirty three, which is nineteen ninety eight. But yeah, but, but you must you must assume. I mean, get the speed master. Obviously, they didn't know NASA wanted to test it. Really, did they? It, it failed quite a few of the tests, but failed fewer than anyone else. So it got through. Um, you'd have thought that once they did move on to DSAs, someone at, at Omega thought we should probably test it and see if we throw it through the same test, see what happens. So the, the um, Bulova provided. The, the Gemini missions had Bulova tuning fork 24 hour clocks and Omega provided tuning fork powered clocks for Concorde, which were still in it up until the end of service. So they, they did get put into these high usage um, sort of mission critical roles, but just never on the rest of an astronaut. Absolutely. I mean, there's a Bulova clock on the moon, isn't there? Somewhere? Probably. Yes, they left it in the uh, landing module. Yeah. Hmm. That would be the one to own. Although, annoyingly, they had to keep sending astronauts up every eight months to change the battery, so. You could have put a solar panel in, really. Oh, um, if only they thought, if thought only. that through, yeah. If only. Um, yeah, a any more for any more? Or have I, uh, uh, between Wolfie and I, have we nerded out too much? We've gone too far. Uh, Bill wants us to get into the 2.4 megahertz stuff, so. <laughs> <sighs> Not tonight, Bill. Later, later. Not tonight. Um, yeah, so I, I can feel myself edging more and more into these electronic watches. Like the one James showed today, when I first saw it, what, were two, three years ago, James? Yeah. I wanted it then, <laughs> um, <laughs> frankly. And uh, they don't come up for sale very often, and they are quite expensive when they do, because I think there's a, there's a small group of people that know what they are and want them. Mm -hmm. 
yes, law, supply and demand. There's more of a demand for them than there are pieces around. Mm. But the problem is, what I mentioned about it being such a, a butch piece, is there's an awful lot of gold in it. And I think a vast majority of them were melted down in the 80s when gold was, you know, fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars an ounce. Um, yeah. I did wonder about that. If they made a thousand of them, but the gold was suddenly worth that much money and you're not mm. that interested in the watch. Yeah. Um, and so with that, if you wanted to have that fixed, do you know if Rolex can still work on them today? I doubt if they could, but I have two people who can work on them. I have somebody who does general repairs in the UK and I have a guy who is a world expert in, uh, in continental Europe who does who could literally probably re rebuild one of these from scratch hmm. and is it internally is it is it's very similar to other beta 21s a beta 21 it's, is it's beta identical 21? to other beta 21s right. all, all of the beta 21 movements were built in one factory hmm. and literally there's a little plate that is applied that is screwed on that either says patek philly or rolex or omega or longine or whatever hmm. that's the yeah. only difference hmm. interesting um, I think we should probably wrap it up for today. Thank you uh, so much to Chris and to James. Um, yes, thank you. It's been, thank been you. fantastic. Um, thank you to Matt for uh, wonderful co-hosting. Um, thank you to everybody who came along and joined us today and asked questions and in some cases told us more about our watches than we already knew. Uh, it's yeah, very yeah. much appreciated. <laughs> um, and we'll be back again next week. Take care, everybody. Have a good week. Thank you, Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye.